Welcome back, students. Uh, Philippine History Part 3. So, we always start with a quote. Who the hell wants to hear actors talk? That's a quote by, if you can believe it or not, H.M. Warner, one of the Warner Brothers and uh, founder of Warner Brothers Studios in 1927. This was just before the beginning of the talkies. By the mid-1920s, technology had been developed for adding sound to films, but the Big Ten studios were opposed to adding sound for a number of reasons. Uh, they weren't sure the public would accept it. I think it's an excuse. Some were, of the top stars were foreign-born with heavy accents. That was true. A lot of the, uh, the, the more famous actors were born in foreign countries, were difficult to understand. They thought if they tried to make that transition, they would be able to. So that was probably, probably pretty accurate. Three, many stars had weak voices that didn't match their macho or uh, seductive images. You know, uh, you can imagine some actors <laughs> are very convincing until they open their mouths, right? Uh, four, many actors who didn't have stage experience had voice and diction problems. There's a famous actor who did make the transition with diction problems, W.C. Fields, if you recognize him. Uh, he, you know, talked out the side of his mouth. Yeah. Uh, but he made the transition, and he was extremely famous. Uh, the studios had spent large sums of money promoting their stable of silent stars, and many of them would not be able to make it to the talkies. They'd spent in, invested money in all of the silent actors, promoting them, uh, you know, making their films, and they're afraid that if they aren't able to make that transition, they've wasted all that investment. So that's probably a legitimate concern. <clears throat> Six, it would mean investing hundreds of thousands of dollars to build sound stages. That's the real reason. And it's always about the money, isn't it? It's why uh, the theaters and um, Hollywood were really reluctant to make the transition to uh, digital films. Same kind of thing here. They just thought, um, you know, it's going to be too expensive. It's gonna, we're going to have to build all these sound stages because up until now, we could shoot anywhere. Now we have to be careful about sound. Number seven, producing sound films would be significantly more expensive than making silent films. A $1 million silent film would cost at least one and one half million dollars with sound. That's legitimate. It does cost more. It did cost more at the time to make that, that transition because of the extra production values involved in uh, shooting sound. Uh, the technology was there, but it was more difficult to shoot sound than it was to shoot silent. Number eight, although it was relatively easy to use subtitles to meet the needs of foreign distribution, you couldn't expect actors to speak in different languages. It took them a long time to overcome this one. What did they do? They ended up dubbing films with uh, other actors who spoke the languages, or they would, you know, I mean, up until this point, all they had to do was change a title graphic, right? And you could distribute it anywhere. Uh, but after this, you know, it took them a while to come up with the, the concept that they could have other actors dub the dialogue and uh, release in foreign countries. Number nine, silent film directors talked actors through their moves while they were on camera. Sound meant that actors would have to remember what to do and they, wouldn't ha and they would have to memorize dialogue. This is a legitimate problem. Uh, directors you know, the big me megaphone, they directed their actors during the scene, hence directors. They told them what to do what to, and how to respond, and they were looking for that performance, but they didn't have to memorize dialogue. They just had to do what the director told them to do, what the director directed them to do. And finally, number 10, 1927. In 1927, there were 15,000 theaters showing silent films, all of which would have to be equipped with the expensive new technology. And again, it's about the Benjamins. It's all about the money. You cannot force a, an industry to make a transition easily. They have to make it when they're comfortable and when the numbers can justify uh, the expense. So, for years, I mean, we talked about Edison. Edison had, sil had sound that he synchronized with his early films right at the turn of the century. And by 1927, we still don't have sound movies in the theaters. How ridiculous is that, right? So the problem was that they had to make that transition. At some point, what finally motivated them to do that? Um, 
The big studios stuck together for uh, some time in discouraging the introduction of sound. However, one studio, Warner Brothers. Warner, the one who just, you know, said, who the hell wants to hear actors talk, right? But Warner Brothers was outside that group. And given the formidable competition from the other studios, they were struggling to survive. Warner Brothers almost went out of business at this point. So they bet the farm. Uh, they had nothing to do, uh, nothing to lose by trying something daring. They didn't feel that sound would be more than a passing novelty, but for as long as it lasted, they figured they would make them enough money to stay afloat. Sound was already being used in some theaters for movie uh, tone news, for newsreels. And um, so most, most theaters didn't have it, but some theaters did. The theaters that had sound newsreels, people would come in, watch the newsreel, find out the current events of the day, and then watch a silent movie. Kind of ridiculous if you think about it. So, but they used those theaters. They partnered with those theaters to release the first sound movies. So in 1927, Warner Brothers introduced the first feature length sound film. It was called The Jazz Singer. It featured Al Jolson, a famous uh, singer of the time. Um, the film consisted mostly of background music and contained only two segments with synchronized lip sync sound. Uh, a total of about 354 spoken words, but that was enough to start the revolution. That was enough to make everybody demand sound movies at this point. It was uh, the avatar of its day. So once the film captured public attention, people were lined up around the block from early morning to late at night to get tickets. The first blockbuster, where they're all the way around the block uh, waiting for tickets to this movie. And Warner Brothers Gamble paid off, big time. As a result, the studio has remained a powerful industry leader for the last 80 years. Uh, more like 100 years at this point. Recognizing a good thing, Warner Brothers rushed another film with Al Jolson into production. This one, The Singing Fool, was an even bigger hit. Uh, unlike uh, Birth of a Nation and the sequel being, you know, a flop, this is as big, even a bigger hit than The Jazz Singer. Uh, the Singing Fool was in, uh, cost $200,000 to make and brought in $5 million, a big amount of money for the day. Al Jolson, a vaudeville performer, was a perfect choice to launch sound. He had a natural talent for relating to audiences and was a megastar of his day. Now the major studios are worried, right? They, they thought they could get by without doing it. One studio does it, they all have to do it. So, faced with the inevitability, the major studios reluctantly abandoned their stand against sound and started building sound stages. Here are some of the first sound stages being constructed in Hollywood. Within a few years, almost all films were talkies. But the move to sound was not without its consequences. So, many stars didn't make, as they anticipated, didn't make the transition to talkies. And they left the business. Others quickly signed up for voice and diction lessons in an effort to try and save their careers. Even so, the studios used the special needs of sound as an excuse to get rid of some actors that they felt that they were paying too much. Hampered by the early limitations of bulky sound equipment uh, and the influence of sound technicians who were all but dictating how everything should be done, film production techniques took a giant step backwards. Films got worse. They, they regressed. You know, there had been some real uh, great advances to this point, but now... With the advent of sound, it's taken a step, step backwards. Many of the early sound films were not only crudely made, they were downright boring. Another major problem was that the camera had to be housed in a soundproof telephone booth-like enclosure to keep the noise of the camera from being picked up by the microphone. This meant that the camera was virtually immobile, and that since this was before the advent of zoom lenses, shots had to be static, unimaginative, and at a distance. So, film got boring. By this time, the movie industry had clearly established three basic economic divisions, production, distribution, and exhibition. Uh, distribution is getting the film to the theaters. Theaters are the exhibition wing. When the NPPA guild was dissolved by government antitrust uh, action, the studio heads, that should be MPPA, uh, moved to another type of control, the studio system. And we're going to talk about more about the studio system in the next one. Now, MGM, 20th Century Fox, RKO, Warner Brothers, Paramount, Universal, and Columbia dominated the studio years between 1930 and 1950. 
During this era, the studios created elaborate sound stages and backlot movie sets and developed a well-coordinated and efficient factory system for creating films. The studios hired a stable of stars and production people to do as many films as possible. They were put on contract. Not only the actors were under contract to a studio, but the the talent, uh, but the crews were as well. So, um, you know, you couldn't work for the other studios. You just worked for whatever studio you were under contract to. And that way they could limit your wages and make sure that you did as many films as possible. You couldn't say no. These people were under contract and were not allowed to work for any other studio without permission. During this period, Warner Brothers was known for its gangster films, MGM for its lavish star-studded musicals, and 20th Century Fox for his, its historical adventure films. Now, an oligopoly is when a few companies control such a large part of an industry that the action of one affects all of the others. That's what they had. That's what the that Warner Brothers had, or what the studio system was at that point, and why Warner Brothers doing one thing prompted all the other studios to have to do the same thing, because it was an oligopoly. Although most studios were located in Hollywood, uh, they were managed through their New York business offices. So remember, studios started in New York and New Jersey and were being managed there, but located in Hollywood because they realized after the independents moved to Hollywood that they had to have studios there too to be competitive. So studio heads like Louis Mayer and Daryl Zanuck controlled all of the business decisions right down to managing the lives of the actors that were in their films. They told them what they could, couldn't do. They managed their careers. They uh, sometimes farmed them out to other studio heads. But for the most part, if you worked for a studio, if you were under contract, you didn't work for any other studios. These companies also controlled theater chains and distribution of their films. Having shed the control of the MPPC, <clears throat> The film industry was now under the control of a few powerful studios. <coughs> By this time, films had changed enough uh, from the small wooden bench Nickelodeons to lavish theaters. During the boom, theaters were opening at the rate of one a week. And these are big theaters, um, like the ones downtown. You know, those were some of the theaters that were opened in the days of the studio system. They put a lot of money into opening these theaters. In the big cities, they're even more elaborate. At this time, everyone regularly went to the movies and an average ticket price of 65 cents, everyone could afford to go to the movies. Now, during the golden age of Hollywood, the studios controlled the industry and the profits. One way to maintain control was what was called block booking, or requiring theaters to take many inexpensive second-rate films in order to be able to show a few really good movies. Theaters were sometimes required to sign up for packages of a hundred or more films, sight unseen. So they'd have to pay for a hundred films to get the one or two that they knew were going to be blockbusters every year. This was called block, bo uh, block booking. Now, early in this era, four major film stars, Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford, The Little Tramp, and uh, uh, Ever America's Sweetheart, her husband, Douglas Fairbanks, uh, who was known for uh, swashbuckling, you know, sword movies. I said sword, didn't I? I said sword. Uh, and D.W. Griffith, who did Birth of a Nation, joined together and rebelled against block, book, uh, block booking by opening their own studio. And I mentioned it last time, but this is the real event. So this is when it took place, was during this studio era. Um, and they opened their production company, and it was called United Artists. United Artists against... The oligopoly. Um, their company not only eliminated block booking, but also went on to produce many films that are considered classics and was in existence until just recently. That's it for this one. See you next time.